This week, we're throwing you a curveball, and we're going to talk about guitars. Don't worry, though. It's still space-related. That's right. We talked to Josh Stutler of Oak Creek Guitars, who builds custom instruments and has created some amazing Apollo-themed guitars. Can you think of any other times where space crosses over into other worlds? Let us know via our social media pages, at Space and Things 1, on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast, on Instagram and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us on Patreon. Find out how by visiting patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 125 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 125 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm hanging in there. I'm getting over some 24 hour bug, but I'm okay. I don't want people to be like, oh my God, Emily's dying or something. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm better today. And I think one of our listeners, um, this is not very space related. I think one of our listeners sent me a taco for uh, the cats, like a taco (laughs) enclosure. I just wanted to say, whoever it is, thank you so much. I love it. Smokey is obsessed with it, of course, because she's a little chunk. Uh, It's her new (laughs) bed, I think. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much, whoever sent it to us. Uh, We love it. Thank you. Amazing. Did you watch these Falcon Heavy launch the other night? Oh my God, I did. I wanted to talk about it and things that I saw this week. Let's save it. All right. When Emily and I were in Hutchinson, Kansas last month, I noticed there was a couple of guitars on display at the first and last steps gala, which we attended. And the next day I saw a man walking around carrying one of those guitars. Now, playing the guitar is how I make a living. So I was keen to go and have a look at what all this was all about. The guitar in question was called Eagle. The reverse side features an image of the Apollo Command module docked with a lunar module flying over the lunar surface, along with the Apollo patch logo. And it has the patches around the side, and it's signed by a number of astronauts and mission controllers. And the front is designed to look like an Apollo Command module, where the sound hole is the hatch. It's really quite something, and obviously quite hard to describe. But I'm going to put plenty of photos on our social media pages for you to look at. So make sure you go and check that out before you listen or just as you're listening or perhaps afterwards. The man responsible for this guitar that many of you may have seen at Space Events is Josh Stotler of Oak Creek Guitars. And we thought it would be a great idea to interview him to find out the story of this guitar and how he came to make it. This is one of those episodes where we give you something that you perhaps had never given any thought to. But we hope that you enjoy hearing all about Josh and his incredible craft. Honey, my hat's off to the guys in the trench. I love them. Yeah, kiss that man that runs MSFN. I don't know if I can do that, though, but I'll say thank you. Okay. Welcome, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us on Space and Things. So what came first, a love of space or a love of guitars? Oh, man. I would have to say a love of space. I grew up in the shuttle era, so... I mean, just all that shuttle launches and and I, it was just wild to me. So I, I the love of space was there first. So it it kind of was always there, <laughs> even even as a very small child. I remember uh, being fascinated with space and planets and rockets. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> And one of our Patreon subscribers, Don Owen, who sat on your table at the gala in December, you may remember him, he has asked this question. Did you have a mentor when it came to building guitars, or did you pick that craft up on your own? Oh, that is a great question. So the guitar building, uh, to answer the question first, I did not have a mentor. Um, It was trial and error very very many trials and errors so uh long story short i wanted a guitar when i was 14 um couldn't afford one so a 14 year old brain of course says ah let's build one no way (laughs) so with with supplies from home depot no knowledge of luthiery uh which is building guitars 
and uh, very little woodworking experience, I set off to build one of the most intricate things you could build woodworking. So, yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. I had no idea that was that was how you, how you uh, came about. What was the first guitar you, you built then? Was it that one or, or what was the first one that worked? So, so the first one that worked was the first one I built, thankfully. Um, Amazing. I built a solid body electric bass, which I kind of tailored to look like Paul McCartney's uh, Hofner bass. So it was a viola shape. <laughs> nice. Um, rudimentary electronics. It actually had a pickup from a six string guitar. I didn't know any better. It has no <laughs> truss rod in the neck, so I don't keep it strung up for fear of you know, yeah. it finally collapsing. But I, I do have it. It still plays. Um, I'm proud of it. And, and it uh, sits in my shop. That's very cool. Very, as a Beatles fan, obviously big fan of that. And when did you design your first space related guitar? So I was lucky enough to be at the Apollo 9 Gala at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. That was in 2019, uh, March 13th to be exact. I was standing in line waiting to talk to Gene Krantz and all these people were coming up saying, hey, I work for SpaceX or hey, I, my dad worked on the Apollo missions and I'm standing there just waiting. I get up there and I say, I build guitars. And he, <laughs> he leans in, he says, really? And I say, yeah. So I, I, he goes, do you, have you ever made a, an Apollo guitar? Oh my God. And boom, that was it. That was it. He says, do you have a card? So I hand him my card and we talk a little bit. And then that, that was it, man. That was the birth of it right there. Standing in the space, our greatest adventure part of the San Diego Air and Space Museum, talking with Gene Krantz. That's where the space guitar was born. Okay. That's pretty cool. I feel like we've missed a step here. So <laughs> you, you go from making your own guitar. W when does that become a business? Was that something that, did you have to go to college? I feel like I've missed a step in my question in here. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I, I, I built my first one when I was 14 and then that seemed to satisfy my need for a bit. My grandma bought me a, a store-bought guitar from a pawn shop after that, realizing that, Hey, I was kind of serious about about learning an instrument so it was another bass so fast forward oh god uh to 2006 i'm in wiesbaden germany i was over there with my spouse at the time and they had a great wood shop on, on post at the wiesbaden army airfield so i was introduced to the crew there at the wood shop i started volunteering my time and with the army everybody's stuff is shipped over in crates well there's a lot of broken stuff so I, these guitars kept coming in. They, I, I would work on guitars and I, I built three while I was over there and people would see it. There's a big picture window. It's kind of like a goldfish bowl. So people would look in and go, Hey, what's that guy built? Is that a guitar? So they would come in and say, Oh, Hey, coincidentally, I have a broken guitar. Can you fix it? I never said no. So they, <laughs> they just started coming in. I was able to volunteer my time and fix other people's broken guitars in exchange for time to work in the shop. So I, I spent had a lot of my time there. I was also a firefighter for the Wiesbaden fire department. So that's what I went to college for. Right. So there was no woodworking in there. I've never taken a woodworking class ever to this day. Um, so it was all just going for it, just jumping in both feet. So from 14 to the time I was uh, 25, there was just the one guitar. So <laughs> after that, it started building. I, I was building as a hobby for a long time. When I finally came back to the States in 2011, I was still building as a hobby, decided to actually start a company so I can make a little money doing repairs and inlays. And for years, it was just a side, side business. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I finally... Finally pulled the plug and started doing it full time. So it was a scary jump and it's it's a, a slow climb, but my name's getting out there, thankfully. That's amazing. So the idea for Eagle and the space and the Apollo guitar came before you were full time at, at building guitars. Yeah. So that was it was starting to get serious. Um the the idea for it came to be just as I was thinking about doing this full time. And then to get eyes and ears on what my plan was for Eagle, I would talk to people in the space community, being here in San Diego with a, a world-class museum. Yeah. Thankfully, there are a lot of those type of people. Um, Jim Kidrick, uh, president and CEO of Air and Space Museum. Uh, we have Francis French here in town. So um, it's just 
getting the word out about what I had planned. I drew up a set of plans and I ended up sending those plans out to astronauts, mission control personnel wow. to get the word out about what I had planned, what I was doing, what it was going to look like. And so I first said to Jim Lovell, because he was sort of instrumental in who is this for? Is this, I said, it's for me, because I, I ended up getting a call from Jim who was talking <laughs> with Gene Krantz about my project that wasn't even a project yet. So, <laughs> so it, there was a, a couple huge names in the works here, kind of pulling the strings to get this thing going. Little, little did I know. So talking with Jim, God, there's too many Jims here, talking with Jim Lovell, he says, who is this for? And I said, well, it'd be for me. I, you know, no, no, no. You gotta, you gotta do it for somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Boom. Light came on for somebody. All right. San Diego Air and Space Museum. I've gone there since I was a kid. I took field trips there and it blew my mind. I love that place. I could go there every day and be happy. So I send an email to Jim Kidrick at the Air and Space Museum and said, if I build a Apollo themed guitar, would you be interested in displaying it? I got an email back, I think about two hours later saying, can you come in tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so having no plans drawn up yet and just having the idea in my head, I, I, I said, yeah, sure. I can, I can come in tomorrow. So in that time between the email and me going to the museum for my meeting, I quickly drew up this 11 by 17 set of plans with the front, the back, a couple isometric drawings, and away I went. So I, I show up, and, and Jim was thrilled. He said, yeah, well, that's, that's not really what he said, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, we're interested in it, but we don't want to share it. Can you build two? And me being a huge idiot said, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> so so I there are two of these guitars so there's actually Eagle which is at the San Diego Air and Space Museum and it, it's named Eagle for many reasons one because I was at number 11 for my guitar builds nice and nice. Eagle just made sense and I skipped a number and mine is number 13 Aquarius cuz 13 is one of my favorite flights so uh so I have 11 Eagle and 13 Aquarius, which will eventually be donated to a, a different museum when I'm through getting signatures. Amazing. So Eagle is on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Yes. This is amazing. So, okay, I, I've seen, I think I've seen Eagle. I've got photos of Eagle from when we met in Hutchinson. Yeah, both, that. both of them were actually there bracketing okay. the astronaut uh, photo. So yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. I remember there was two, but the next day I only saw one of them in, in the museum. Correct, yes. Okay. So uh, what blew me away was this, the sheer level of detail. One, it's a beautiful instrument to play as well. I think this is key to, to know for people. This isn't just a aesthetic thing. It was a beautiful instrument to play, which I think is probably the main thing when you're an instrument builder, right? Yes, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, first and foremost, it's a it's a guitar. I, yeah. I want it to be played. It sounds great. I'm very happy with it. And it's it kind of makes me sad that it spends most of its life in a in a case spinning around for people to look at. But it it was built to play, and I, I encourage people to play it as I I did when you walked up. Yeah, and I love 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 hearing people play it. I was fortunate enough to be able to play. There was a a song written by the. Um, the Byrne Brothers band called Charlie Duke took country music to the moon. Amazing. So <laughs> I learned that song before I met Charlie at the last space fest. And he, he comes after me. And he was the first signature on the guitars. He's been fantastic uh, advocate for them. And he says, you know, they wrote a song about me taking country music to the moon. And I said, Oh, this song. And I said, Oh my it. God. And, and he just lights. I go, that's the one. <laughs> So uh, later on, uh, after the astronaut photo, somebody had asked me, they were there when I, I played a little bit of that song, and they asked me, hey, we missed it. Would you mind playing it again so we can record it? I said, sure. So I set up in this gaudy room at the the Tucson, <laughs> and uh, I'm playing Charlie Duke took country music to the moon, and this face comes around the corner. And it's Charlie. And um. This is the first weekend I've met him, so I'm I'm, I'm close to him now. Um, but this is the first weekend I met him. So I'm still a little starstruck. And uh, he comes up behind me, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he starts singing the song with me. 
Oh my so god! So I'm I'm nervous as as all get out, and just trying to make it through this song. I fumble a couple words, but he catches me, and uh, we we sing together and have a great time, and we've been friends ever since. So <laughs> it's it's great. That is amazing. What a story. Um, so what what I was going to say, and I'm glad I I made a point about mentioning how playable it is. What I was going to say is what struck me was the sheer level of detail. It within the artwork of this guitar. Um, so uh, let's start with the back side of the guitar and then we'll move on to the front, which is more incredible. So just talk us through, go from the head down through the neck and then, and then what's on the body. Yes. Yeah, so um, the design didn't change really at all from what I drew up that first night. So on the back of the headstock is a replica of the Silver Snoopy Award, which is Anybody that knows space is familiar with yep. Silver Snoopy Award. Snoopy was the safety mascot of the entire Apollo program. So he is there um, in all his silver glory. There's a little plaque that says the name of which guitar it is, Eagle and Aquarius. That's one of the only ways you can tell them apart. Down the back of the neck is a quote from John F. Kennedy. It's not the, the quote most people would have used. Um, it is the quote that um, it, it will not just be one man getting us to space it's you know an entire nation um, nice. i thought that was more inclusive than than some of his other quotes and I, I just liked it from the start down to the heel cap now the heel cap is one of the two ways you can tell the guitars apart right on eagle there is a little cutout of the command module and under that little window in the wood is an actual flown piece of the apollo 11 command module of capton foil wow so on, on 13, it's actually a piece of netting from Aquarius that Fred Hayes cut out before they jettisoned. So, wow. Um, moving down onto the actual body of the guitar is a large, quite large Apollo logo with the Apollo A, the moon and the earth. Everybody's pretty familiar with it. And then below that is a inlay. This is all wood. There is no paint or anything on this at all. So there is an inlay of the command module and the lunar module as it would look on its way to the moon. Over 1,300 pieces, I believe it is exactly 1,328 pieces of inlay what? on each guitar. And the reason such a high amount is because on the sides, so we're moving to the sides now, and this, this is bent wood, curvy, are reproductions in wood of each manned Apollo mission. So the, if you think patches. of the patch, the You're mission right. patch wow. for each Apollo mission out of wood, each individual pieces, each <laughs> oh color is a different God. piece. Yeah, it, it's insane. I was struggling through this thing. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, around it is every Apollo mission patch. I included Apollo Soyuz test project, too, because... Nice. Apollo is Apollo to me. Moving on to the front, uh, starting up at the headstock, Earth Rise is one of my favorite pictures. It's it's hung in the the White House in the Oval Office. It's one of the the most famous pictures ever. I replicated that in wood. <laughs> so, oh my god! So you have the Earth surface, the Earth coming up over it. I know the way it appears on the guitar is not how it was originally taken um, or how it's usually displayed is not how it was usually uh, how it was taken with the moon to the right side and the earth coming up to the left, but that's how it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, moving down to the fretboard, there is from top to bottom from the first fret all the way down to the 26th is a wooden Saturn five rocket. Amazing. So it, it takes up most of the fretboard. It's radius to 10 degree radius, like a uh, an acoustic guitar should be, so it's not flat, making mm -hmm. it even more difficult. Yeah. It has inlays of, you know, the flag of the USA, everything that you see on the Saturn V. All the colors, it's each uh, an individual piece of wood. So <laughs> crazy. Uh, and then moving moving down to the body, uh, the body, I wanted it to look like a flown command module so after it gets back so all the the foil is peeling off there's scorch marks around the the, the bottom where the where the heat shield is and it, it, it looks rough but it was a, a labor of love to get it that way I, I tested different burning techniques so I actually did burn took a torch to it um, I used different 
shields and hexagonal pieces of metal to get the effect right is just it, when I dive in, I dive in deep. So <laughs> there was no half-assed for this one. It was it was uh, all or none, and and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Absolutely, I love the the way you've used the hatch as the as the sound hole and the little windows as well, <laughs> uh, and also you even got the handles that the recovery crew would have used yes, to, to yeah. pull themselves up on there as well, which is quite something. I, I wanted it to be as authentic as possible, so if you do get a chance to look at one of the guitars very close up, there's actually the degree marks on the little window for docking. Oh, Those wow. are actually etched into the little window, so it gets pretty pretty detailed. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing and even the the label underneath the sound hole is the plaque replica of the that's plaque right. that uh, sits on the lunar module yes. leg on the moon i like to put little easter eggs and little tributes all over if i can so yes the the plaque on the inside which tells the number of the the instrument who it was made by is very similar to the uh, the landing plaque that all the Apollo missions used that was on the leg of the limb below the ladder rungs. There's only going to be ever going to be two of these, right? You're not going to make any more. I've been offered money to build another one, and as hard as it was to decline, it was also very easy to decline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't ever want to build another one of these. <laughs> it was... It was uh, a once in a lifetime thing and I'm happy I did it but I will never do that again <laughs> that's amazing and was it always your plan to try and get it signed by the Apollo heroes one of our Patreons John Wisenhunt has asked if you'd be willing to share any, the reaction of any of the astronauts when they saw it absolutely so yes um, this thing was just a vehicle to try to get signatures on it so I wanted to promote the Apollo era i wanted to give a little tribute to it uh, i get a question a lot why a guitar well that's what i do if it, yeah. if i built motorcycles it would be an apollo motorcycle so <laughs> that's the reason there but i always wanted and hoped to get it signed but i had no no connections whatsoever in the astronaut field until this so <laughs> uh thankfully the san diego air and space museum has a list a master list and was nice enough to share it with me so i I've done a lot of legwork. I've had a lot of a lot of happy recipients. I've had some not so happy recipients. <laughs> I've had some some declines, but for the most part, the the reception has been phenomenal. Especially it's it's hard to explain when you have something in your mind and it hasn't been built yet. Yeah. Hey, this is what I'm doing. Would you be willing to sign it when it's done? That's kind of are you going to finish it? Will it ever be done? When is that? You know, that's that's tough. But now that it's done, it's um, a little bit easier to say, hey, here's what I did. Check this out. So the very first person that signed it was Charlie Duke, and he was blown away. When, when he opened the case, it, it's sitting in there. It can't move around. It's, it's this giant flight case. And you open it, and it's just kind of like, oh, yeah. You know, well, you don't know where to look first. Is that's the yeah. one of the the tricky deals with this. But once you finally get looking at it, Charlie is pretty much the only one besides me and a, a handful of people here in San Diego that got to see it without signatures. And I, I kind of miss that that yeah. guitar. <laughs> um, I have pictures of it. I'm I'm planning a book that will detail the entire process from. Nice thought to finished product but charlie was just oh my god you know just blown away and then uh a couple other walt cunningham um was there at the time uh sadly we just lost him but he was my second second signature and um everybody that sees it just they they find something else about it all of them move it around to look for their own mission patch and some of the the most meaningful experiences with it have been the family of astronauts we've lost so al warden's grandson played it for about an hour at oh, space nice. Fest, sitting over in a corner him and i just sitting there and he was he was just jamming on it rosemary rusa was just thrilled and she she just kept rubbing her hand over her dad's mission patch oh. it's always different but it's always fantastic meeting somebody that has something to do with with the apollo era what most people don't know and will never see is inside the bracing on the inside of the guitar, 
are the names of all the fallen astronauts who didn't get to fly. Oh, wow. So, oh. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So I was um, fortunate enough to meet Charlie Bassett's widow. I happen to have a picture on my phone as I was building the guitar of his brace. And I, I showed her and she was just blown away. Amazing. So it was, it was pretty emotional. <laughs> That's so cool. That's, I mean, this guitar is the gift that keeps giving. I didn't realize it had all that as well. That's amazing. And I guess as well, it just, with music being such a, a connecting thing, people can relate to a guitar so much better than they probably can other bits of memorabilia, right? And that's part of the allure of why I wanted to build this. Maybe somebody isn't in, interested in space or, or flight, but they like music. They like guitars. What is, what is that over there? Yeah. I, I love walking through the museum and just watching people interact with the with the exhibit with the guitar in it because they say, oh, well, whose guitar was this? Yeah. Was this an astronaut's guitar? What is this? So it just draws you in. It's something different. And I, I don't want to say it's a gimmick, but it's definitely something you don't expect to see in a space-themed museum exhibit. And I think that's what it relies on to draw you in is what is this? Yeah. yeah. That and the fact that it spins around and the light hits it, and every once in a while you get that glimmer, and it's the only thing moving in that whole <laughs> you know, space wing is this guitar sitting. It sits on a one sixteenth scale lunar module descent stage, so, cool. so so which spins around. So it, you get that glint every once in a while. What is that? What is shining in my eye? And people move over to it. Oh, it's a guitar. So. If it brings in one kid that may have not been interested in space and makes them interested in space or aeronautics or flight or STEM or building guitars or woodworking, I'm happy. Absolutely. All right. So another question from Don Irwin. Can anyone commission a new design? For example, if Emily wanted a Skylab-inspired ukulele, how would the conversation go to come up with a final design? Ah, that is a great question. So these two guitars, Eagle and Aquarius, have actually opened the door to a handful of other space guitars. So I was contacted by Dot Cunningham for Walt's 90th birthday, and I built him a 90th birthday present. Oh, my God. Acoustic guitar that I was able to present to him at that party. Oh so the process goes, Hey Josh, here's what I have in mind. You can contact me uh, via Instagram, Oak Creek guitars, or on my website, www.oakcreekguitars.com. Fill out a contact form or just email me directly and tell me what you have in mind. I do all my own designs. So if you did have something in mind, I'm happy to take a look at it and can replicate it exactly. Or if you have an idea, and don't quite know what you want or don't have the artistic skill to do it, I'm happy to mock something up. It's always free. So I will work back and forth with my customers saying, here's what I had in mind. Check this out. And they, nine times out of 10, it's holy crap, yes. Or I didn't think about that. Or yeah. And very, very rarely does somebody, I don't think I've ever had anybody not like something. <laughs> so, all right, let's change that to 10 times out of 10. Everybody says, yeah, that's great. So thankfully, my customers have been fantastic. I was contacted by Coda Woodall, who is uh, Fred Hayes' granddaughter. My wife and I have become good friends with her. We actually met her at Walt's 90th. She's a, a blast. She's just hilarious. And I have been working with her for about six months for a gift for Fred uh, for his birthday, which was this last November. So it ended up being, he doesn't play, but he, he always goes on and on about the, the Apollo guitars. I, I want one of those. I want one. She says, Papa, you don't play. He goes, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I built him a, a ukulele, which is a, kind of a tribute to his entire career Amazing. from, you know, his test flights to Apollo all the way through the shuttle approach and landing test. So it was just a, a tribute to Fredo and, it's one of my favorite pieces I've ever built. And I was lucky enough to be able to present it to him in Hutchinson, Kansas, just before the first and last steps event. So we did a, a big astronaut dinner there at uh, Prairie Dunes golf course. And I got to see firsthand his expression when I, I handed him his present from Coda. That's amazing. That is a, what, a, what a experience to be able to be behind those closed doors and, 
and 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 share those moments, right? Who'd have thought just from talking to Gene Krantz about the fact you <laughs> build guitars, all this would have happened? I, I think about that almost every day, and I, I just go, "Wow, what if I didn't go to that? Yeah. What what path would I be on now? Who knows?" But I am so thrilled to be within this little space group now, and and meeting people like yourself and Emily, and and just getting to geek out and talk space and it's really something no uh, before we finish i just want to want to ask another thing about oak creek guitars in general you don't just do mm -hmm. space guitars do you so there might be people thinking oh that's a it's a bit niche for me as a guitar player what else do you do do you just do normal guitars or do all of them have to have the artwork theme on them i run the gamut so from repairs uh minor repairs to major repairs historical restorations from your little minimal repair job all the way up to taking the entire guitar apart, refinishing. I do it all. So there's the repair side of it. There's the restoration side of it. And there's also custom builds. So I recently finished up a Jerry Garcia themed guitar that looks like one of Jerry's for a customer. It had all kinds of inlay on it and, and just turned out great. And the customer was thrilled so I do a lot of themed guitars, but it doesn't have to be a themed guitar. It can be a simple everyday player. It can be a piece of art you want to hang on your wall. I hope you play it, yeah. but if you just want to hang it, that's fine <laughs> by me. But yeah, so it runs the gamut. It doesn't have to be a space guitar. It doesn't have to be a, a themed instrument. I'm happy to talk to anybody about any project they would like to go forward with. Well, that is amazing. Um, my ma obviously, I'm a guitar player, and it's my job, right? It's, it's playing guitar. So now my mind is going, what do I want? What do I want? <laughs> How can I challenge yep. him? But also, I, I know I have a budget. So <laughs> it's uh, yep. the age-old problem with guitar players, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. What What do I want? And and then the problem is, what do I want next? That's the yeah. <laughs> that's the addictive part of it. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need another one in a different tuning as well. Is that possible? <laughs> that, that, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. This has been uh, amazing, absolutely amazing. I wasn't expecting to be smiling as much, at, or or this story to have gone <laughs> as many places as it went. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll we'll meet again and see each other again. And and uh, next time in San Diego, I'm definitely going to go and revisit that guitar and try and spot some even more even more details that I didn't spot before. Excellent. I look forward to it and let me know. I'll, uh, I'll meet you there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, all flight controllers, keep watching your data. I'm still going to be asking for a go to go here in about four minutes. Uh, now, obviously... Guitars and space, me going to be a bit of a fan of that, aren't I? But I sent you the the images earlier, Emily. How beautiful is that guitar? Those are just exquisite. I, I'm not a guitar expert whatsoever. You know, I love music, but I'm, I couldn't tell you the first thing about tunings or uh, strings or anything like that. But um, just looking at it, I mean, the design is just just absolutely exquisite. I would have a hard time playing it because I'm one of those people like, if I see something beautiful, I'm like, I don't want to touch it. Yeah, when I got to play it, I felt that way. It was like, oh my, should I be playing this? Yeah. But it's such a beautiful guitar to play as well. But I didn't realize when I saw it up close, and I know it makes sense, I assumed all those artwork that you see on it were all painted on, and they're not. They're all bits of wood that he's molded into the design. I mean, curved woods and all the patches and all that that he's had to make out of wood and put together as this it's just outrageous it's uh, i'm just in in awe of his yeah i'm in awe of his talent to be able to do that it's crazy yeah. so there was two things he told me after the interview emily which i thought were pretty cool he's building two other guitars at the moment one of them is uh, an apollo 14 guitar someone contacted him about a moon tree which original moon tree which fell down uh, and he's making a guitar in conjunction with rosemary russa in honor of her dad who obviously took the seeds for these moon trees around the moon and now she's going to have an Apollo 14 themed Stu Rusa themed guitar out of wow. wood which is from a tree which is from a seed which he took to the moon I mean that's just incredible that's right special. that's just amazing especially because Rusa I, I hate mentioning this Rusa didn't live to be very old he died in the 90s 
many of us never got to meet him. Having something of his like that, that's kind of a, I guess, a collectible to the family must be really special. Absolutely. Especially you've seen this, when we interviewed Ro- Rosemary, there was a story about uh, her mum having Elvis's guitar as well. So the guitars are linked with that family. Do you remember that? That's funny. I'm wearing an Elvis shirt today. I, I know. That's what made me think of it. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Dang. Um, yeah. And also, he's working with Max at Lunar Replicas to do a, an AstroVet Apollo 15 guitar as well. Oh, boy. The Al Warden style. I have an idea, but it's terrible. They're not going to do this. I hope they don't do this. But that would be like a flying V or something like that. Like yeah. <laughs> V-type guitar. like. <laughs> so, Emily, I have a question for you right now. If you were to have, as a piece of art, appreciate that you, you can't play over either a ukulele or guitar, a Skylab-themed guitar, what would you want on it? What What would be your defining things that you would want on oh it? Oh, my gosh. It would have to be missing something, like, as a joke. It would have to be missing a part to it, like, something, like, a big piece of it, and, like, a string would have to be broken or something on the side. <laughs> it would have to have, like, a humorous touch, like, yeah, parts of it are not here. No, I, I think the patches would be really beautiful. I mean, but that's a lot of work. But, yeah, you would have to have the, you know, the program patch, you know, and the three mission patches. And a big bit of gold foil over the top yeah, of it. Yeah, sort of a little bit it. of gold, like sort of a gold finish maybe, and maybe a little bit of <laughs> scrape off of it. Just a scrape, like, oops, something happened. Like, a little ding. Something, something happened here. Yeah, but something like that. But that would be a Skylab guitar. Beautifully damaged. Slightly used. <laughs> yeah. Slightly yeah. used. Before it even got used. Yeah, slightly used. Well, as always, the full interview unedited will go up on our Patreon page. Yeah, I I found this interview great, so I I hope that people have enjoyed this. I know this is very much me uh, doing something for me on this one, but it's it's called Space and Things after all, so I do like it when we get popular culture things clashing with space. I think that's really cool. You got a hold of my legs, Joe? Yeah, one of them, one of them, good. So, Emily, what caught your eye in spaceflight since last week? Oh, gosh. Uh, The main thing that caught my eye this last week was the Falcon Heavy launch that took place on Sunday evening uh, around 5.56 p.m. my time, Eastern time in the United States. So I went to my local fishing pier. (laughs) It's it's very (laughs) unglamorous, but we have a, a bridge called Gandhi Bridge that's not very far from where I live. And so I went there because it's facing the east. So if you want to see a launch from here, it's the perfect place to go. That's where I watched SLS from. Right. So anyway, we watched Falcon Heavy and, you know, we're about a, approximately at that location, approximately 100 miles out. So I wasn't really expecting much, you know. Holy crap. It was incredible. It was really visible from here. Like we got to see the the contrails. Um, I actually took a video of the launch and it's on YouTube. It's not the best video in the world. I'm not a professional videographer or photographer in the least. Yeah, it was exquisite. You got to see the bright orange flame. You got to see the, the you know, the contrails going up and then you saw it go into its orbital trajectory. And then it, it did that thing uh, where it turned into like a, a, I don't know how to describe it, like a ghost tadpole. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, you've yeah. probably seen it before in, in <laughs> pictures and stuff like that. But it, it turned into that because at the time of the launch, it was dusk and the light just hit it the right way. And it, I mean, it was just you can't see me, but I'm doing a chef's kiss emoji. <laughs> it was just exquisite. It was probably one of the most beautiful launches I've seen from here. I actually saw the stage set from here, like when the boosters came off and started coming back. We could see it from here, wow. which is nuts. I was not expecting that at all because we're about 100 miles out. Had you seen a, a Falcon Heavy from your way before? Yes, I did. I saw one. It was in June 2019, and I think that was the Celestis name drop here. Uh, I think it was the Celestis <laughs> Heritage Flight launch. It was the one that had Bill Pogue, the Skylab astronaut, on it. Oh, wow. And I was not working for Celestis. Full disclosure, I worked for Celestis. Memorial Space Flights. I don't. I was not working for them yet, but I, I was excited because I knew he was on that flight. And of course, I'm a big Skylab nut. So I went outside to watch it and it was like the middle. It was like at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. I know yeah. it was the middle of the night because I got up, you know, and it was pitch black and every, you know, nobody else is up. So I did go out and watch it. And 
it was pretty, but for some reason, this one just was even, it was just phenomenal. Like, I think it was just the way the light was hitting because the sun was going down and we were at sunset, you know, and in Florida, yeah. <laughs> we're very spoiled. We have beautiful sunsets. Yeah. Like the video that I took, it it's like the sky had like the gr this gradient effect about it. It was just like, wow, like the launch against the sky. It was just like perfect. So that's really been on my mind. Honestly, that's been on my mind since it happened. It, it was really one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. And it was worth getting a bad head cold. Though. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what did it because, yeah, honestly, um, we Floridians are not adapted well to cold weather and it's been very cold here the last few days so i i braved the cold and went out in it and froze and that's probably why i've been sick the last few days but it was worth it it was worth every second any night spacex launch seems to produce something magic doesn't it that there's they're just beautiful i remember the images of the inspiration Four launch and other launches that have gone at that similar time dusk to, to early evening as it goes into the at the night but you are still got a bit of sunlight in the sky from the west hitting the the contrails as it gets up to that height there's something happening there that just creates something magical doesn't it yeah it's amazing i i did watch inspiration four from um the same place the local fishing pier we didn't see a lot of it because there was a little bit of cloud cover but it was still you could see it light up the cloud bank mm. from, and i'm like whoa like they're really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, even from as far away where I'm at, they're still very visible and they're really pretty. So, yeah, yeah SpaceX has some gorgeous launches. I'm, I hope to see. Uh, <laughs> I know it's not going to happen this year, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the next SLS one. That thing had some juice. <laughs> to it. I mean, it was just we it lit up the sky here, which yeah. was nuts. I feel a bit spoiled, but I want to see another one of those. Absolutely. In the near future. <laughs> next year. Next year. Next year, next year, yeah. I hope to beat that one. What's been on your mind this week, Dave? First of all, a little update on the on the Russian Soyuz capsule that we talk, spoke about last week. I think this is worth bringing up again. So they've announced they're going to launch a new capsule up on February the 20th. And Joel Montalbano, who is NASA's space station program manager, told the reporters, he said, I'm calling it a replacement Soyuz. This is the next Soyuz th that was scheduled to fly in March. It's not a rescue. <laughs> We're not calling this a rescue. We're calling it a replacement. Which I think is really weird. And they've also confirmed they think it was a micrometeorite that, that hit it, which is what caused the leak. Not a rescue, okay. Yeah, we've got a broken spacecraft. We have to spend another one, but it's not a rescue. Cool. You don't like that word. That's what it is. Yeah. They don't like the word. Absolutely. They don't want to say the word. They don't like it. In aerospace, I hate saying this. When you work in the industry, and I'm saying this as somebody who works in the industry, there's certain words people hate, yeah. and that's one of them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Rescue. Because it connotes that something bad happened. I'm probably going to get slammed by everybody here. It, it is a rescue. It is a rescue. And the thing is... I as we kind of talked about last week, it's not like the Soyuz is a privately owned thing, right? It's a government-sponsored launch. They don't have to worry so much about shareholders. I don't know why they're worried about using that kind of terminology. Maybe they are worried about government funding. Who knows? But Propaganda. Yeah, it's just weird. To, to me, it's just weird. But... Which brings me neatly on to, have you heard of this company called ABL? You know, I have not. Neither had I. But they just had their first orbital launch attempt for their RS-1 rocket. Now, no one knows what ABL stands for. <laughs> They've not released it. There's nowhere else. No, it's nowhere written down. To, that now my brain is trying for, to think so of can... an acronym. <laughs> I know. My brain is like automated butthole launcher. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. ABL is going to send me the worst email on the planet. Like, how dare you? I'm sorry. I'm just guessing. I don't know what it means. Yeah. I don't know. Well, they, they didn't have a particularly good time. So it was their first orbital launch attempt, and it went wrong. Now, there was no live stream of this. This was up in Alaska. But apparently, there's quite a lot of damage to the launch pad. Oh, boy. So yeah. it was one of those kind of failures. Uh, they had two test CubeSats on board. So uh, obviously, they were hoping to get them to orbit, but they didn't. But it seems a bit odd, that one. That, we that just is odd. Don't know much about them. What does this mean? Like, is it a front for the government or something? Is it like, um, is it like a, I don't want to say this because they're going to, they're going to send us the worst email. Oh my God. 
Oh my god. I'm not gonna say anything further because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to point that out because I think it's another one of those scenarios where private companies have a failure early on and I just don't yeah. think the the public has a stomach for this anymore. I think they're expecting more from private companies. Yeah. Uh, which is un unattainable. And I think actually now the barrier to entry for private companies is getting really high, even though actually the technology is getting more accessible. Not that it's easier, but it's getting more accessible. People are understanding it a little bit more. It's actually getting harder because to get the funding is so on edge. Yeah. Because if you have one little error, that's it. You might not get as much funding because there's other companies that people could invest in and might have a better record. Yeah. It's just a very strange time to be a private space company, launch company at the moment. I think people see companies like ULA, which has public-private partnerships, and they see companies like SpaceX doing so well. People see SpaceX going just from strength to strength. I mean, that that Falcon Heavy launched this weekend. Mm -hmm. It was flawless. I mean, that's a rocket that has not flown much. What, fourth flight? Fifth flight, oh, maybe? I hate saying it. I don't want to jinx anything, but you would expect one of them to fail by this point, almost. And you wouldn't be surprised by it. But it, mm. it, it looked perfect from my vantage point. And I mean, I think people see this and they get so like, well, you know, ULA can do this. SpaceX can do it. Why can't everybody do it? It's because it's not easy. You know, I mean, yeah. I think certain companies make it look easy, kind of like how Olympic swimmers make things. I used to watch Olympic gymnastics and I'm, man, I could do that. That's easy because I took gymnastics when I was a kid. And <laughs> if I tried any of the stuff Simone Biles did, I'd be probably in a body cast for like <laughs> several months. I think it's the same thing with space flight. You know, I think. I'll put NASA in there, you know, NASA, SpaceX, ULA, all these contractors who've had a long record of success, knock on wood, organizations that have had had long records of success. They make it look easy like a athlete makes it look easy, but it's not easy. It's basically a lot of people in their prime <laughs> yeah. putting something together and companies that are startups, you know, they're still finding their way. It's normal for them to not have success the first few times around. I would yeah. say the um, first few times. And, and people should read Eric Berger's book about SpaceX liftoff and you'll find out that yeah. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever it was, they, well, not quite 25 years, they were struggling. They yeah. had failures when their first rockets and it was hard. Fortunately yeah. for them, there wasn't the eyes on them then that there are on these newer companies yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. Because I think people expect companies now to be, oh, it's the new SpaceX. Yes, be, exactly. It's like, you guys forget that companies like SpaceX had a lot of problems at the beginning. You know, they had trouble getting their vehicles off the ground. And if we go even further back, you know, orbital sciences back in the day, now they're, yeah. I think now they're part of Northrop Grumman, but they had launchers that had issues back in the day and they were more of a private company. And none of that stuff was perfect. Space is very difficult. If it was easy, everybody would be able to do it. I totally agree with what you're saying. Now, of course, there's one other thing I would like to mention, and that was the return of the Cargo Dragon, which had a number of things on board. But excitingly for us, it also included the Moon Gallery, which we spoke about on episode 77. That's right. With two of the artists who had a piece of art within the gallery, Gillian Fitzpatrick and Justin Donnelly. Now, it has returned to Earth. It's been nearly a whole year, 50 episodes of the podcast since we last spoke to them. But it's returned to Earth, having orbited for so long. It may be a while before the Moon Gallery Foundation have the gallery back in their possession. But they recently posted, looking forward to receiving the payload and organizing the first Earth Gravity Show. So that's pretty cool. So hopefully we'll be able to keep you posted on news about where that's going to be displayed. And maybe some of our listeners might be able to go and see it. Uh, but must be amazing for Gillian and Justin to know that their little piece of art has gone to the space station and come home. That's awesome. That is really cool that it's back. Yeah. So I may have had more than one thing to talk about this week, but it doesn't matter too much. It's just how it is. And from every window, we have a really spectacular view of the Earth, and as well as the, uh, what surprised me, the real, real blackness of space. I don't think I've ever seen black as it is out here. 
Well, thanks for listening, and thanks to those who have signed up to our Patreon page this week. We've had a few people sign up, and we've surpassed 50 subscribers for the first time, which is a big milestone for us. I would love to get to 100 by the end of this year, and I think that's a huge ask. But if anyone would consider going to join us over there, it would make such a difference. We have to make so much more content other than perhaps just a weekly podcast. Um, so please consider joining if you're able. And thank you so much to those of you who, who have done that and, and heeded our call for more people to join. Yes, thank you for listening, and we'll be back with more next week. But until then, don't forget that in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.